Lesson five, orbits. Now we're gonna get into some nerdly cool stuff. This is the physics that they were working on in the 1940s and the 1950s when they said, hey, let's try and think about how can we send up a satellite? And then in the 1960s when they were saying, how can we send someone to the moon? But the moon was not, the moon launches were not orbits, but certainly in our current society, are satellites fairly important to our standard of living, to the technology that we use? Absolutely. You guys are used to being able to see or communicate with anywhere on the planet. That's only been for about the last 40 years or so. Up until then, to try and reach someone on the other side of the Earth, we needed to either have, get to have a physical connection. They used to lay long telephone cables across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, but those telephone cables could only handle so many calls at once, and if they were all being used, you could not reach someone in Europe or in another country. Well, with the advent of satellites, we just bounce the signals off the satellites to the other side of the planet, and it works just fine, and it's at the speed of light as an extra bonus. Example one says, draw a force diagram for the mass m, little m, in orbit. What are the forces acting on that little tiny satellite or planet? And I'm going to say get the obvious ones. Now, the obvious one is gravity, but which way would gravity be acting towards the big planet? The only force acting on it is that one, except little note. Fg is not mg because we're not on the Earth's surface. Instead, Fg is going to be big G, big M, little m over r squared. But you may notice, Megan, that this planet is also tracing out a path. What path is this planet tracing out, or this satellite tracing out, oh pray tell? A circle. So, where is my net force? Towards the middle. And I only have one force towards the middle. This is the equation that will never be given to you that you need to realize is occurring when we're in orbit. Centripetal force equals, you know what, actually, Mr. Duick, write it in the correct order. Gravitational force equals centripetal force. Because we know this is what's pulling it in orbit, and we're moving in a circle, we can conclude that. In fact, really, it's the same physics as my little uh, ball on a string tension toy here. Here's an orbit, except in this orbit, string is providing tension, is providing the orbital force. In a planet or a satellite, gravity is providing the orbital force. Example, a 10,000 kilogram satellite is orbiting 20,000 kilometers above the Earth. You know what? This is going to be 20,000 and then three more zeros, meters. Let's fix that right away, right, Pat? And we're going to do one more thing. We're going to underline the word above. Underline the word above. says write the force equations. So what we're going to say for part A here is gravity equals <coughs> circular or centripetal. Now gravity is going to be big G, big M, little m all over R squared. Circular, I have two options for acceleration. I have the v squared over r, and then I have the new one that I showed you last day, the 4 pi squared r over t squared. They're both on your formula sheet. Which one do I want to use here? Well, is this question dealing with period or speed? I glanced at part b, and I said, oh, they want me to find the orbital speed. So I'm going to write this. Now, here's the most common mistake. Look up. Kids go, oh, v squared over r. That's not a force. What is that? Acceleration. Mass times acceleration, please. Mm -hmm. 
but you'll notice something that happens. What do you notice? Yeah, the size of the satellite has nothing to do with how high it has to orbit. The space shuttle will orbit at exactly the same height and speed as another satellite that weighs only a few kilograms right next to it. The, the orbit height and speed depends on other things, but it does not depend on the mass. Although they told me the satellite was 10,000 kilograms, I don't need that. Also, how many R's on the bottom here? How many R's on the bottom here? Two. How many here? One of the R's will cancel. And if you don't believe me, you can move an R up to there and you would say, I got one on top, two on the bottom. One of my R's will cancel. And in fact, I end up with this. V squared equals big G, big M, all over R. Now, B says find the orbital speed. This gets me V squared. How would I get V? Okay, V is going to be the square root of big G, big M over R. And you know what? Because this is new, we're going to go old school a little bit. I'm going to list my data. What's big G? What's big G? You have to know this. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Doesn't mean you have to memorize it. It's on your formula sheet, but you better know how to find it, and you'll probably end up memorizing it. <coughs> big M is the mass of the Earth. I can't remember what the mass of the Earth is. You know what? Can all of you get your formula sheets out? You're going to want them in front of you for the next three weeks or so. Actually, for the next month or so. Because when we do uh, electrons and protons, you need to know their masses and their charges, and no one memorizes them. So, Mr. Pilgrim, what did you get as your mass of the Earth, please? And the last thing that we want is the radius of the orbit. Now, this is why I underlined the word above. Above means that this distance here is 2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 2 times 10 to the 7th. But our equation is not designed to work from the Earth's surface. Our equation is designed to work from the center of the Earth. So to this 2 times 10 to the 7th, I am going to have to add the radius of the Earth, which is, Justin, do you have it in front of you as well? Uh, 6 point something. I can... So the radius of the orbit is 2 times 10 to the 7th plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. Okay. Above the Earth's surface means I better include from the center of the Earth outwards. Is that okay? Does that make sense? Here, the, the, the other word that they'll use is um, altitude. If they use the word altitude, that's also measured from the Earth's surface. If they use the word orbital radius, that's measured from dead center, and we don't need to add. Question time? 20,000 kilometers, which is 2 times 10 to the 7th meters. That's that distance right there. Okay? I didn't feel like writing 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Is that okay? Okay. You need to keep straight when you need to add the radius of the Earth and when you don't. If they talk about the orbital radius, don't add the radius of the Earth, please because you'll get totally the wrong answer. So what I end up with is this then, my orbital speed up there. If I want to stay that high, how fast do I have to be traveling in my satellite? This fast. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.98 times 10 to the 24th, all divided by 2 times 10 to the 7th, plus 6.38 times 10 to the 6th. I'll type what's inside the square root first, and then I'll hit equals, and then I'll square root answer, I think.
I get 3888. Let's see if you get the same thing. Yes? No? Yeah, 3888. Actually, 3.89 times 10 to the third meters per second. How, um, how fast is that satellite traveling here on the Earth when it starts out? Zero. Then we hit the launch. How fast does it have to be traveling tangent to the radius to stay in orbit? 3.89 times 10 to the third. That's a lot of kinetic energy. Where does that energy come from? From the fuel. This is why it's so expensive to put satellites up there. They're expensive to build, yes, but they're also darned expensive to put up. That's a staggering amount of fuel. Oh, and we haven't calculated how much potential energy you'd also need to give it to get it uh, 20,000 kilometers up. Where's that potential energy come from? The fuel. You may notice that any big rocket that you see has large fuel tanks. You've seen the space shuttle, right? The big underbelly tank, which falls off, and those two solid rocket engines, which are basically nothing but fuel. We need that to get the velocity for orbit and the potential energy for orbit. It's got to come from somewhere. Then I said, note, orbital speed is independent of the mass of the orbiting object. It depends only on orbit radius and central mass m. So we have a scalar equation. We started out by doing this. Gravity equals circular. We said big G, big M, little m over r squared equals m v squared over r. We said, hey, mass cancels. Hey, radius cancels. One of them. And we get this. Now, this is the equation for velocity. I do not memorize this equation. I memorize that I can do this, and I can derive whatever they need me to derive. If they're talking about the velocity or the speed, I'll use this. If they're talking about the period, how long to go around once, I'll use 4 pi squared r over t squared, but there's still going to be an m in front. Whatever they want me to find, then I can get the variable by itself. Because this is, although it's ugly, Megan, you'll notice it is straight cross multiplying. It is one big fraction equals one big fraction. So it's yeah, it's ugly, but it's not too bad. Example three. Says fill in the proof <coughs> below to show that when an object is in orbit, its inwards acceleration is the same as the gravity field at that distance. This tells us that objects in orbit are not floating. They're in free fall. I'm going to say that again. The space shuttle is not floating in outer space. It's falling down. It's in free fall. And the astronauts, when you see them floating inside the space station or inside the space shuttle, they are not weightless. They are in free fall. Only they can't tell because the air that they're in is free falling at exactly the same rate as they are so they don't feel the breeze on their face the way I did when I jumped out of the airplane. I mentioned that I jumped out of an airplane. The way I did when I jumped out of the airplane. This confuses people. They're like, no, Mr. Duick, I see them floating up there. They can't be in free fall. Because if they were in free fall, they'd come crashing to the earth. We're going to come do this proof in a second. But... Here's the explanation. This is what Sir Isaac Newton memorized. Uh, memorized. This is what Sir Isaac Newton proposed. He said he imagined standing on a large mountain and throwing a ball, a baseball, or in his case back then a cricket ball, very, very hard horizontally. So throws it pretty hard and it lands there. Throws it even harder and it starts to go over the curvature of the earth and land there. 
there is a velocity you could throw it at, just the right velocity, so that even though it's falling, it's falling at the same rate as the Earth is curving, and that there is an orbit. All objects in orbit are actually falling to the Earth. What we do is we give them just the right sideways velocity, that velocity at that particular radius, so that they're falling at the same curvature of the Earth. So even though they're falling down, they keep moving sideways. They say the same distance away from the Earth's center. Yep. Yep. So Pat said, Mr. Duke, does that mean we can orbit at treetop level? Uh, theoretically, yes. Uh, air resistance would be a huge issue. Nice thing about outer space, little or no, some of the satellites orbit in the in the small parts of the atmosphere because the atmosphere doesn't just stop; it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and weaker, 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 weaker. But certainly, very little air, if no air resistance in outer space. Here on the Earth, you'd have two issues. So the speed you can, we can actually calculate it. It's very simple. Put the radius of the Earth right there, because if you add one tree to the radius of the Earth, it's going to be like the ninth decimal place. Who cares? And you can figure out how fast you need to orbit here on the Earth's surface. Um, air resistance and obstacles. So what you really need to be saying is uh, maybe instead of a tree, top of a mountain. Certainly orbiting at the height of Mount Everest is doable. Okay, That's what the astronauts do in the Vomit Comet, by the way. You guys know what the Vomit Comet is? What's the Vomit Comet? Anybody know? Dylan or Evan, go ahead. Okay, to practice getting used to weightlessness without going into orbit because it costs big bucks, I just told you why. All NASA has, it has a 7, I think it's a 747, and it's nicknamed the Vomit Comet because when you're weightless, one of the first things that happens is you puke. You, your stomach's not used to it, but you get used to it eventually. And all this plane does is it goes to an altitude of about, I think, 60,000 feet, something like that, and it dives down at negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And because you're inside the plane and the air inside the plane is moving with you and there's no windows, you can't tell that you're diving down. All you know is, I don't feel normal force anymore. I feel weightless. It's called apparent weightlessness, not true weightlessness. True weightlessness is if you're at the edge of the universe away from any planets and gravity is not acting on you, that's true weightlessness. Apparent weightlessness is gravity is acting on you, but we've, uh, we're going accelerating at the same rate of gravity, so you can't tell. So let's do this proof then. It says fill in this proof. <coughs> A equals V squared over R. That's inwards acceleration. And then it says substitute V equals for orbital speed. Actually, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to substitute V squared equals. Because if I scroll back, do I have an expression for v squared right here? And in v squared over r, it is squared. So I'm going to say that v squared I can replace with a big G, big M over r. Big G, big M over r. And here's what I get then. A equals big G, big M over r, and then divided by one more r, this guy which is really, Tyler, the same as... I can see you guys squinting. Sorry, let me make it a little larger. Is that better, Ty? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. That's right. You guys got a wonky picture there. That's right. That's going to look... It looks like... On, I finally moved to Office 2010. It looks like Office 2010, strangely enough, is not compatible with Word from Mac 1995, which is what these were originally typed in. My summer project, all these diagrams, I'm going to have to redo them. I'm not looking forward to that. Dividing by R, though, same as having an extra R in the bottom, and you get, this is what we said last class, the expression for the gravitational field of big G, big M over R squared. So actually, in orbit, they are under the influence of gravity. They just can't feel it because they're free-falling. I felt what the astronauts felt when I jumped out of my airplane. Have I mentioned that I jumped out of an airplane? <coughs> oh, the only difference, Sally, is I felt the wind on my face. There they can't because the air that they're in is bottled up inside and free-falling with them. Okay. 
all an orbit is is throwing something at just the right sideways velocity so that it falls at the same curvature of the Earth. And yeah, you could orbit on the Earth's surface. Certainly, many proposals have been written if we ever build a moon base with no atmosphere there. Absolutely, we could have things orbiting the moon 100 or 200 meters up. Very doable because it's also got such a small radius and such a small mass. The speed, not very excessive. In fact, numerous proposals have said, if we if, imagine this is the moon and you have another base right here, the easiest way to get stuff back and forth would be to build an electric cannon that would launch stuff halfway around the planet. Easy to do. Easy to do. With, with current technology. You don't even need future technology. You need the moon base, which is future technology, but the actual transport, easy. Okay? So, the fact that in orbit... An object in orbit is in continuous free fall is interesting. It means that things in orbit are always falling towards the Earth, even if they never get there. It explains why astronauts seem to float around in the space shuttle. Both passengers and the ship are in free fall, falling at the same rate, and therefore the ship cannot exert a normal force against them. Fn equals zero. And it means that astronauts experience continuously, until they get used to it, the physical reaction or feeling of falling. So the feeling if you've ever jumped off of a high dive or the feeling you get on the elevator, they have that permanently and they got to get used to it and some of them never do. Okay. Some of the astronauts in the Apollo moon landings, for example, were throwing up the entire trip. Now, I believe for money now, there's a private company that's taking people on the equivalent of the Vomit Comet, and you can experience weightlessness. A couple of thousand bucks. Oh, that would be fun, though. Even if I did throw up, it would still be way cool. You guys see, um, two years ago, uh, NASA brought Stephen Hawking, the wheelchair scientist, onto the Vomit Comet because he's done so much for physics, and they carefully, they do it very carefully because he's got medical conditions, but they allowed him to experience weightlessness, and you can just see him just grinning like a schoolboy because it's everything that he imagined that it was supposed to be like. <laughs> Pat, since you asked, here it is. Uh, in a cartoon, a character kicks a football the wrong way, but the football orbits the Earth, and it still goes through the uprights, but it just goes through the uprights in the opposite direction. What speed was the football moving? Or... To your question, Pat, how fast would you have to be moving to orbit, let's say, at treetop height? Okay. I know we already have the expression in the box. That expression in the box is not on your formula sheet. So I'm going to start out by saying we're moving in an orbit, so gravity equals circular. <coughs> gravity is big G, big M, little m, all over R squared. equals. Circular is going to be m. I got two circular equations. Is this question asking or talking about the velocity speed or the period? Speed? Oh, so let's use v squared over r. What if instead it had asked, how long would it take you to go around the earth? Oh, I would use 4 pi squared r over t squared. And you can calculate that as well. How long would it take you to go around the Earth if you were in orbit? However, they wanted speed, v squared over r. Lo and behold, the mass cancels. Lo and behold, one of the r's cancels. And I get this. v equals... big G, big M over r square rooted 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 mass of the earth was 5.98 times 10 to the 24th is that right yeah divided by and now we are on the earth's surface so let's use the radius of the earth and it was 6.38 times something 10 to the what six and square root that whole thing What is my v orb, my orbital velocity? I 
I think, from what I recall, I think it'll end up being in the tens of thousands of meters per second. I don't think it's in the hundreds of thousands. What'd you get, Dylan? Seven. Oh, that might be right. Is uh, someone else? Seven thousand nine hundred. Yeah. Okay. Seven thousand nine hundred meters per second. Basically, eight kilometers a second. Fast, but actually doable. If the Earth was a vacuum, we could easily do that right now. We got stuff that we can get going that fast. The space shuttle goes faster than that once it gets out into outer space. We can do it. It's just air resistance would be a huge issue. And that's going to be the answer to part C when it says, why can't we do this on the Earth, but why can't we do it on the Moon? Air resistance. Uh, going that fast, your object, the friction from the air, would get you so red hot, I'm sure you'd start to be almost be melting metal. Right? Uh, what does B want? Oh, this does want the period. You know what? I'm going to start out exactly the same way. Gravity equals circular. Gravity is still big G, big M, little m over R squared. Circular is still mass times AC, except I don't want to use V squared over R for AC. I want to use the one that has the period in it. Megan, what's the one that has the period in it? You have the sheet in front of you, which is why I picked on you. No, the formula sheet right there. Find circular motion. Yes? There's two equations for circular acceleration and gravity, right? Okay, we're on the formula sheet. Find circular acceleration. There's two equations. I want the one with the period in it. Yes. Okay. By the way, I'm doing that. You guys need to know that it's there. Last year, for some reason, I had half my kids. I didn't know what that was or that it was. It's, it's on your sheet. You don't have to memorize it. What is it, Megan? Four? Again, most common mistake, kids forget to put the mass there, in which case this mass doesn't cancel. And since I didn't give you the mass, they freak out. No. It's mass times acceleration. Now, second most common mistake, look up. This is wrong. That's wrong. Because where would this R end up moving when I move it to the other side? On the bottom. In fact, I'm going to end up with an R to the third. Let's get the T squared by itself. I'm going to move the T squared up here. These down here, this up here. This is where this is why, by the way, at the beginning of the year I showed you that whole things move diagonally trick. It's for this equation. We get this t squared equals four pi squared r cubed all over big G big M. How will I get rid of a squared? Square root. By the way, what's the exponent on the r? If I got the r by itself, how would I get rid of a cubed? Cube root. You will be cube rooting sometimes during this unit as well. That's if you know how long you want the satellite to take to go around the Earth, and you want to know how high do I need to put it up there. Because every different altitude will take a different length of time to go around the Earth. So if I heard you correctly, t is going to be the square root of whoo, 4 pi squared, 6.38 times 10 to the 6th cubed. Have I mentioned that you probably want to be practicing with your calculator during this unit? Are you starting to see why? Hello, hello, hello. Divided by 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. That's how long it would take to go around the Earth if you were orbiting on the Earth's surface. 4 pi squared times 6.38 times 10 to the 6th cubed divided by bracket 6.67 Scientific notation button, negative 11, times 5.98. Scientific notation button, 
24. Close bracket. That's too Oh, square root, Mr. Duick. Square root that. And I'm getting 5,070 seconds. And you know what? I'm a nerd. Divide by 60. 84 minutes to go around the Earth. Is that fast? Yep. If you didn't get that and you want me to come look at your calculator, now is your chance to ask because I see about eight of you leaning over to a neighbor, showing them your calculator screen screen and you have tears in your eyes two of you seem to have the same name so if you need some help now is your chance to ask you're off by a half a minute uh, C Pat what do we say why can't we do this on the earth surface but why is it possible on the moon Air resistance and also man made obstacles, buildings, things where, again, in the moon, as long as you were over the tallest mountain on the moon, you're just fine. Okay? And uh, you can extend that also to other planets, by the way. Uh, oh, no, no, Mars has an atmosphere, doesn't it? Never mind. Most of the planets have atmospheres, so also you'd have air resistance on the other planets as well. I'll take back what I just said. Supposing that you want to build a satellite, let's say a spy satellite, and you want it to orbit the Earth every 300 minutes. Now, first of all, what's wrong with 300 minutes? Okay, what is that in seconds? Let's write that right above it. How many seconds is that? 1800, zero, zero, 18,000, is that right? Okay, so you want it to orbit the Earth every by the way, what is 300 minutes in hours? <coughs> What's 300 minutes in hours? Please do some arithmetic, boys and girls. Tyler. Okay, so the US or the Russians or China or whoever has the technology, they're building a satellite and they'd like it to, they figure, if we have it go around the Earth every five hours, that gives us a pretty good spying window. How high must that satellite be? Because <coughs> there's only one height where that will work. We're in orbit, so that must be true. Big G, big M, little m over R squared equals M. Which circular acceleration equation am I going to use? Ah, I think they've mentioned the period here, not the speed. So I'm going to be using the one that has the period in it, which was what, Megan, my angel? Yeah, keep going. No, it's not 4 pi. Okay, so common mistake number three. I, I, as soon as you said that, I, good, she did it because I want to jump on that one. Kids forget the squared on the pi because you're just not used to squaring a pi. Usually in all the rest of your equations, pi has been all by itself. Yeah, it's pi squared. Good. What do they want us to find? How high? Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to find the orbital radius. That's the distance from the center of the Earth to the satellite. And then once we have that, we'll subtract the radius of the Earth, and that should give us the altitude that's left. Does that make sense? In other words, get the R by itself. Well, let's move this up to there. It's going to give us an R cubed. Let's move this. Oh, wait a minute. Yay, masses cancel. That's good because they didn't tell me how heavy the satellite weighed. In fact, I think I'm going to get this. R cubed equals big G, big M, T squared all over 4 pi squared. Yep. So... 
Sally, like if you want to, you can memorize all these different permutations. I think I've done five so far. We have one for V, one for T, we've got one for R. I know start with this and I can cross multiply and get whatever I need to by itself. It's a much better way to do this. Oh, how do I get rid of a cubed? Oh, cool. We don't do that very often, so it's always nice when I can say, hey, this is actually a useful mathematical operation. The radius is going to be the cube root of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Big M, what planet are we orbiting? Okay, by the way, this is also then, let's suppose you're designing a satellite to go explore Venus and you'd like to orbit Venus every five hours. Here it is, or Jupiter. Here it is, this tells you the height, right? Here it's Earth 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. We want every 18,000 seconds squared, all divided by 4 pi squared. Justin, how many numbers are in the bottom of my equation here? <coughs> Two, I'm gonna have to put this in brackets, okay? You know what? How about all of you that are struggling on your calculators type with me? This is how I would type this, okay? I'll put the top in one big bracket. So I'm going to go open bracket. Six point, try that again. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Come on. As I'm trying to demo this, things are going wrong. There we go. Then instead of bracket, bracket times, less typing, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th times. 18,000 squared. Have I finished the top? Close it off, divided by, open a new one. 4 times pi squared. Close off the bottom. I think that's the best way to type it because it's clear and it's also the least amount of typing. Now we aren't done. That's what's inside the cube root. The only risk with this is you forget to take the cube root, but hopefully you'd say, that seems a little large. That's like five, oh, way bigger than the Earth's radius. Cube, oh, where's cube root on the TIs? Ah, yeah, math, option four, answer. And I get a radius of 1.4, well, let's see. 1.4848 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1.4848 times 10 to the 7th meters. That's five sig figs, Mr. Duke. That's because that's not my final answer. That's not what they asked. They did not ask me for the orbital radius. They asked me how what? How high? So if you imagine... There's the Earth. We have calculated, we have calculated that distance. That's R. We want this distance. That's height, H. What is this distance, why that's the radius of the Earth. So I think if I take this answer, R orbit minus R Earth, that's going to give me my H. And I'll put in brackets in our notes, the other word they'll use is altitude. That's going to give you your orbital altitude. H equals, well, I still have this number on my calculator, minus, what was the radius of the Earth? 6.67. 6 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Of course, I imagine if you're actually putting it in orbit, 
you're way more accurate on your sig figs because I imagine even that much probably makes a bit of a difference. Who uses GPS? Only a couple of you? The rest of you have never used GPS before? What is GPS? What does it stand for? You're right. That's it. Okay. It is, I think, 36 satellites, and they're all fancy word geostationary. They all stay above the same point on the Earth. How do they do that? Their orbital period is exactly what? Which what is the same as the Earth? 24 hours. In other words, if you change 24 hours to seconds, you can figure out exactly how high every single one of them is. They're all the same height. Have to be. A geostation sorry, a geosynchronous or geostationary satellite means it stays above the same place, which is very, very handy. Oh, your orbital period is 24. And they're all at the same height, as it turns out. Well, you can see, because uh, if that's the same, the mass of the Earth isn't going to change. Gra uh, gravitational constant of the universe isn't going to change. Pi is not going to change. Yeah, then they'd all have the same answer no matter what their mass was. They're all at the same height. Get a little crowded, because there are many, many times we want geostationary satellites. It's getting a little crowded. Turn the page. So for what it's worth, we did this. Fg equals Fc. We did big G, big M, little m, all over R squared equals M. 4 pi squared r over t squared. And we had two equations come out of here. You could either say t squared equals, oh, mass is canceled. t squared equals 4 pi squared r cubed all over big G, big M, or if we got the R by itself, we had R cubed equals big G, big M, T squared, all over 4 pi squared. Do I memorize those? I don't even memorize this. I know that. If I'm in orbit and they're talking about period or radius and forces, FC equals FG, go to it. Do the masses cancel every time? Uh, in forces, yes. But what we're also going to be doing next day is asking how much energy fuel does it take to get up there? And, oh, I guess it would take more energy to put a heavier object up than a lighter object up, and they're not going to cancel then. Okay. Homework. Number one. Hey, why don't satellites fall down? Because we give them just the right sideways speeds. They are falling down. But they're falling down at exactly the same curvature of the Earth. Beautiful. Lovely. Brilliant idea. Anyways, uh, let's go number three. Pat, I know you were wondering about the football question on the moon, so we'll move it to the moon here. How hard would you have to kick a ball on the moon to get it to go around on the moon's surface in orbit? Number five, Pat, check your units, kilometers in number five, okay? Number six, they're giving you the period, but they're giving it to you in hours. Please change it to seconds. Got to do a geosynchronous one, number seven. Number nine, astronaut Sally stands on a bathroom scale when in orbit. What does the scale read and convince me? Number 10, and number 11, okay? And the take-home quiz, which I really should have handed out a few days from now, but that's okay. Take-home quiz, last question is a bonus.
Uh, what have I got for orbits? I'm not